we, we actually started our AI journey, journey with an internal use case, which was basically um, answering support tickets, uh, specifically the first response, uh, using a, a large language model. So we started with ChatGPT. Uh, we were able to answer a whopping 0% of our, of our support tickets. Um, the reason is that ChatGPT uh, is pretty generic, right? It, it didn't really know a lot about retools specifically, and it was a bit out of date. Um, so, so we didn't get too far with, with this approach. We then tried some off-the-shelf solutions like um, uh, you know, our, our, our ticketing system provided sort of an AI assistant. There are some other companies in the market that provide sort of plugins to the common uh, you know, support software. But we were only able to answer about you know, one or 2% of tickets um, with those sort of off-the-shelf support bots. And we sort of looked at why this was the case, and we kind of narrowed it down to, to these reasons. The first one is that um, you know, these were only trained on our public docs. Uh, they weren't, uh, they didn't have access to sort of a lot of rich internal company information, such as, um, you know, Slack or Confluence, where a lot of our maybe technical documentation actually lives. The second one is that they were fairly rigid. Um, we weren't able to sort of iterate on the prompts and actually sort of experiment our way to the right prompt, you know, given the context of the question. Um, and then finally, we weren't actually able to integrate um, things like our data warehouse or sort of have custom business logic. Let's say a customer is using our app building product versus our workflow product. We may want to inject different sort of variables into the prompt template. And so these sort of uh, more off the shelf tools didn't quite allow us to uh, sort of accomplish these three things. And we actually think that Retool is a really good place to do the, the second two, right? You know, Retool has a very flexible workflow product. You can write any code so you can, you know, import any Python or JavaScript library so you can get dynamic prompting. We also connect to any database or API so you can add custom business logic and, and sort of bring in you know, data from your you know, core systems. But this first bucket, bucket one, was actually pretty hard to do in Retool. And so we thought about actually sort of building that um, sort of into the product itself. Um, and so we turned to uh, sort of vector stores, um, which is sort of uh, a way to provide context to a large language model. The idea is that you can take unstructured text from all of these different systems, whether they're documents or software tools uh, or, or online websites, um, you know, store them in a, in a certain type of database called a vector database and actually sort of provide the right information depending on, on the question. So we actually built it uh, in-house. Uh, we, we wrote a, a Python script. Um, this started off as a few hundred lines of code. It became a few thousand lines of code. And the engineer that wrote this um, spent maybe a few days on it um, and then had to roll off the project to go back to their, their sort of core job. And it sort of left our support team with this kind of like half useful thing. It was a Python script that worked, but now we had to actually maintain it and update it and add more sources and change the logic. Um, and it wasn't exactly uh, sort of um, super easy for our, our support engineering team to, to maintain this. So we actually built this primitive directly into Retool. Um, and so now our support bot actually lives entirely in Retool and is powered by something called Retool Vectors, which lets you take text from any website, any document, or any third-party tool. And in a few clicks, you can create what are called embeddings from all of that text. And, and now you can provide sort of relevant business context with dynamic prompting, you know, other data sources uh, to create things like support bots inside of Retool. And I'm very happy to say that we now have 25% of our um, first uh, of our support tickets deflected um, on first response, which is uh, a really amazing uh, sort of metric here. Our goal was to land somewhere between 10 and 20% when we started this project. So we're really happy with this. And we think this will only go up over time as we ingest additional sources of information. In, in terms of the, the vector side of things, I sort of talked about um, sort of the value of vectors in terms of actually using it in the product it's really easy now you just go to retool vectors under the resources tab you create a vector from you know a url a document or a website um, or, or or actually a SaaS tool like slack or confluence um, you just click you know retool ai generate text sort of give your prompt which will probably come from like a ui component or, or maybe an input to a workflow and then you just check this box that says you know use, use retool vectors to provide more context to your query and select all the vector namespaces that you want select the model that powers that query and you'll get a very relevant answer, um, you know, based on based on your data. And I actually wanted to show, you know, a quick example of sort of how vectors um, can really help give a relevant answer. Um, so in this case, on the left hand side, you're seeing um, an answer with retool vectors, and on the right hand side, you're seeing an answer without retool vectors. So on the right hand side, um, it's sort of very generic. It's not actually that specific to retool. It knows what an OAuth token is. It knows what an API resource is and retool, but it doesn't actually um, sort of give me any sort of particularly helpful information. You notice on the left-hand side, it's actually referencing like this very custom sort of variable that we use in, in the Retool API flow, and it's much more specific to Retool. Um, and the only difference between these two is that the query, you know, has this checkbox down here. And here we're actually giving it all of our GitHub docs and all of our sort of public docs. 
Um, and then here, we're, we're actually not providing that context. And that's the only difference between these two queries. And so, you know, vectors can sort of have a much more you know, high quality answer. And it's really what took our responses on the support side from, you know, that one or 2% all the way up to that 25% once we were able to sort of vectorize all the right information. This started as originally as a hackathon project and uh, it was providing about 0% of responses, uh, but with the addition of retool vectors and the backend, it became so much more powerful. And this is the kind of the journey that we took to, uh, to go from 0% to 25%. Uh, we started off by testing out of the box SaaS solutions. And we found, as David said, they were too conservative. They didn't give us the flexibility we needed that retool does actually provide. Um, so we moved forward with, with this vectors based approach and we started off by testing it internally. Uh, so every single response to every ticket that came into support would automatically respond with a note in intercom, which is our ticketing platform. And the note would be internal only. So we would see it, but customers wouldn't see it, but we would still review everything. And we found that about 70% of responses were helpful. They either helped in us internally to help troubleshoot the issue. They might not be customer facing, but they still move things quite along quite a bit and gave a lot of impact to the support team. But 70% were useful, but 30% actually were a solution to the problem, even in the early stages. So it was an incredible step up. We, it also allowed us to identify product categories. So if you've used Retool before, you'll know there's lots of different sections. Uh, so we have, we have resources, we have apps, we have workflows. And since we have tickets of all types, we could also see kind of which ones work well and which ones don't, which we could then forward into production and decide which ones we should, uh, we should publicly respond with uh, to customers. So with that, I would like to show you a little demo. As mentioned, the production version of this uses Intercom. So I'm going to show you the Slack version, just I think because you're going to be more familiar with it. Uh, so without further ado, this is a simplified version of our workflow. So if you aren't aware of what workflows are, uh, they are ways of automating tasks uh, in Retool. Uh, you can have your set inputs and you can get your outputs and they can either run via a webhook or they can run on a scheduled trigger. So here, for example, we have this, uh, we have this question input and we have some customer info. So this would be our question from Slack. And you can have this optional check if you want. So in this case, we want to check this customer information and see if maybe they have AI turned off uh, certain features and we can add a branch step in the workflow to decide whether or not we want to continue forward or maybe return back an error down here. If we're continuing forward, we generate our response with retool vectors. It's all nicely in there for us and we can see the, the question matches the input here. And finally, we can either return back the response or in our case, we would have a API, REST API query that posts a message into Slack. Now, this is just a simplified version as mentioned, but you can really go to town on this. Uh, this is our live production version. Uh, we check our retries, we do all this Slack checking. We have all this, you can have, you can add like feature flags. So this is a feature flag I'm working on to, uh, to improve how customers think about writing their questions. And we do all this, this is a, just some JavaScript that amalgamates everything so that we can have a chatbot, like GPT, chat GPT style conversation. Then we have this uh, uh, asynchronous request, which I'll talk about in a bit, uh, and some formatting and responding back. Um, so it's, there's a lot going on, but it just shows how, how powerful workflows can be that I can do this as a support engineer uh, with no experience developing software. Um, so if we come into Slack, uh, do we have some questions? Uh, okay, we do. Let's ask some of these. Uh, can we, uh, I have some up here as well. I'm just going to copy and let's get a couple going at the same time. Uh, so it will respond back to the thinking so that customers are aware. I think the response times from GPT used to be a lot longer. Uh, it's come a long way. I think it used to be about three minutes and now it's roughly one to two minutes, depending on the complexity of the question. One other thing to note with this is the we can have a chatbot GPT-4 style uh, set up here. So once this responds with its question, I can also ask another question and keep the, keep the thread going and have a, an iterative uh, experience, which isn't necessarily available in like Intercom or other, other platforms. Uh, one other great thing about using Slack to host the support bot is it's scalable. So I could put this into any customer channel and customers can now use this without needing to reach out to support. They can just they can just ask the question, interact with this, with the bot without having to, to raise any tickets. And the fact that they can, it responds, oh, here we go. <clears throat> uh, uh, there's a lot of information here. One other thing to note is depending on where you're posting the response, you can actually, uh, you can actually format the data differently. And it's quite important because Slack has its own uh, formatting 
with their own markdown. Um, so let's give that a good response. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a there's one thing that I think is quite important is having this feedback loop so that we can we can identify areas which are good and bad and use that feedback to improve the bot. Uh, so let's jump back to the slides. Uh, okay. So what lessons have we learned? And uh, this is really important because this is how we've improved our, our response rate from being you know zero percent to twenty five percent. This is all the things we've learned along the way. Uh, so if we start with uh, avoiding hallucinations with prompting, the we found a lot of the time doc links would be hallucinated. It would generate its own slug URL. So making sure that you correctly identify hallucinations and tell the bot to not make up information is really important. Also, treating customer input as a source of truth is is never good. I think AI does a is is usually pretty confident that input is correct, but especially in retail. Customers get things wrong all the time, and it's make, it's important to make sure that we sanitize that input so we get a good output uh, as well. Uh, re reducing response variance was a game changer. This was the, that little JavaScript step I showed you in the workflow briefly. So instead of making one response to GPT, uh, we now make two responses at the same time. So concurrent requests to GPT, we get more data back, and then we can deduplicate that data, which means that it's not we're not getting one good output and one bad output every every so often it's just giving a bigger better output that we can then merge into one bigger and better response because uh, before we were seeing times when the same input with the same prompt would sometimes give us a good answer and sometimes give us a bad answer it's going to double your costs but it's going to double how good the answer is there what else did we do we did excluding sensitive data so you've got to be careful about what you what vectors you store so if you're if you're storing sensitive information and you're security conscious try to make sure that that's excluded from your vectors. Like if you're just pulling everything in from Slack, pulling everything in from Confluence, make sure that either you add prompts to to not return that information, or you add uh, or you just remove it from the data source to begin with. Uh, re reducing noise is also important. So, for context, we use Intercom as our data source, uh, but in Intercom by default via API returns HTML, and HTML makes a lot of noise. So we found that when questions were really small. It would pollute the data with uh, the response would be generated with HTML tags because a lot of the input was HTML. So making sure that you strip all of that back, it's not only going to improve your token usage, but it's also going to mean that you get more accurate results. Uh, this is super important. I can't stress it enough. An output is only as good as its input. Uh, customers tend to ask bad questions, even when they're told that they're going to be interacting with AI. Sometimes they'll send screenshots, they'll send one liners, and it's super important to make sure they're asking the correct questions. Like, for example, in the past, I have seen a customer ask a question. They marked the solution as not helpful. I reworded the same question uh, in a better format and got a perfect answer. So it's super important to make sure that customers are phrasing their questions correctly and giving all of the information, any errors, anything like that. Uh, finally, customers don't want to read long generated answers, we found. Surprisingly, not everyone is, is happy reading a big wall of text. Um, if you're able to summarize the response, and if you're able to then elaborate on that, if they like the response, it might help. Uh, but we found that 30% of our solution of our responses are good solutions, but only 25% of customers accept those solutions. So there is some lossage along the way, probably because they don't want to read through the whole thing. So that's something to be aware of. Um, but I guess one thing to, again, bring attention to is all of this testing was only possible because of how flexible the product is and how I was able to just iterate on this without having to go back and forth uh, changing code. Um, so let's discuss the roadmap and where we're going. Uh, so currently, we still want to address, we want to be addressing knowledge gaps. So I was showing you that feedback loop earlier with the plus and minus. What we'll find, what you'll find with the with the bot is sometimes it will give responses and you know that that's not the correct answer. But if you actually search your documentation, you'll find, oh, the documentation actually doesn't have this information. There's a knowledge gap here. And you can use that as a good feedback loop to improve your documentation. Uh, so that's super important. Also, uh, improving customer questions was, super important in the past and it's still something that we need to work on um i still see cases where customers just ask the wrong questions don't provide all of their information so one idea i'm thinking of to tackle this is some kind of like thesaurus slash dictionary approach which uh moderates the input so you provide a list of technical terms that for your product and then it matches against those and then re-asks the customer is this correct and, and gets them to kind of think about the way they're wording the questions uh, it, it looks it looks promising but again it's in testing Finally, the last thing is to scale up to more ticket types and more customers. So right now we're doing a subset of tickets um, and we want to expand that out and we want to give this to everyone. We want everyone to have full access to this.